Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. And look, I am super excited to be chatting with Andy and Justin over at Specter Ops, who are doing absolutely incredible research and great things. And I'll admit, I'm a little bit of a fanboy. I was so excited when, hey, we got a chance to hang out and banter for a bit. Um, but Andy, Justin, I'm curious, what are you guys up to? What's going on? And what are the, I don't know, any things you got some tricks up your sleeve we could dig into? Yeah, so there. I mean, there's there's a lot. There's a lot going on. I think for me, the headline is all about Bloodhound Community Edition. We'll talk about Bloodhound Enterprise later. Justin Justin can talk about that stuff. But what I'm excited about is, is Bloodhound Community Edition, which is the free version of Bloodhound. It's it's the evolution of the free version of Bloodhound that we initially released back in 2016. There's a lot to love about it. There's a lot of pain that it has solved for us internally, which means faster development time, easier deployment, easier development, just all positives. It's also like we also honestly look at it as a way of giving back to the community as well, because yes, we have Bloodhound Enterprise. Yes, we make money off of that software. However, the Bloodhound Community Edition, it's actually kind of a ground up rewrite of, of Bloodhound, and it's now derivative of that enterprise code base. So all of the great enterprise grade, enterprise quality features that you would expect for legitimate actual software made by real software engineers, uh, not me, you can expect with, with Bloodhound Community Edition. So there's a lot to love about it. I've got a couple of cool things, I think, that you know your viewers might want to look at. I guess before I show any of that, like, does that kind of set the stage pretty well, do you think? Totally. Look, I am more than happy. Like, I'd love to tee you up for some of those demos. Um, but could you actually maybe even just level set? If folks are tuning in and like, hey, what the heck is that word Bloodhound? What is that? Uh, what are you using it for? And I know, look, the new Community Edition launch and release was something, look, we're super excited about. And that was pretty recent. I don't know, was that Black Hat time around then? Yeah. But super stoked to see how much easier it is now. And just the fact that, like you mentioned, look, it's it's free. It's accessible to everyone. And it's giving back to the community that I know tons of penetration testers and even defenders like, hey, blue team folks that are like, I want to use Bloodhound as my knee jerk reaction in an environment just to see the lay of the land. But I'll let you color the picture if you'd like. Sure. So what do you think? Like, should I explain kind of like what Bloodhound is in the first place and what problem we set out to solve? Let's do it. And if you've got any visuals okay. along the way, that would be super cool. But uh, all you. Yeah. Well, why don't we, you know, like in uh, in Wayne's world when they're like, it's so like flashback back to like 2010, 2015, like that era of pen testing and red teaming. So I'm old enough that I was around back then. Justin is old enough that he was around back then. Some of your viewers probably are, you know, from that time as well. Back then, it was like MS-08067 was it for a while. And it was like, you get into a network, you throw MS-08067, you're done. Write the report, the client needs better vol management, patch management, you're done. That kind of started to go away after a while as vol management, patch management became more mature. I remember like there have been moments in pen testing and red teaming where we all on the red team side, we took a step back and we were like, oh my God, red teaming is over. I remember when Microsoft put laps out there and that now all of a sudden you can't just pass the hash of the RID 500 from local host to, to other systems. And I remember we were all like, it's it's done. It's over. Microsoft did it. They solved it. They solved security. We, we can no longer red team. We can no longer pen test. Obviously, that's not the case. But that's kind of the time that we found ourselves in was this kind of existential dread of what are we going to do? How are we going to get DA when people have laps? They got they got vol management, they got patch management, and everything is like really really strong. So at that time, there was this methodology that came about uh, that a lot of different teams kind of independently all discovered simultaneously. We called it derivative local admin. So Justin Warner coined that phrase, uh, and then Microsoft called it the credential shuffle or the uh, identity snowball attack. But it was basically get local admin somewhere, dump creds out of that box, pivot somewhere else else dump creds, pivot somewhere else, dump creds over and over and over and over and over until finally you get DA. And so that worked. It was tedious, but it was extremely reliable. And kind of the missing link of taking that methodology and making it a real thing was collection and automation of, of the data that you could get back. We needed, we needed a map. You know, We were all just kind of like feeling around in the dark, like guessing like, well, maybe I'll pivot to that box and maybe there's a DA logged on or maybe that user has you know a lot of privilege. We didn't know. We had no way of telling um, outside of like, maybe they're in a group called local admins, whatever. So that's why we created Bloodhound in the first place back in 2016 is we wanted a way to collect all this data that at the time was accessible by anybody who's domain authenticated, put it into the computer 
and let the computer do the work of finding those attack paths. And so I always say Bloodhound is like Google Maps for Active Directory. It's a pretty good analogy, I That's think. That's awesome, yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> I'm here, I want to go over there. How do I do it? Bloodhound will tell you. If there's, if there's a way to get there, it will tell you exactly how to get there. That was back in 2016. Since then, a lot has been added. Lots of new attack primitives added. However, you know, the, the big thing that I think I'm most excited to talk about right now is this newest version, the newest free version, which is Bloodhound CE, Bloodhound Community Edition. And uh, yeah, I, I do have some demos to show if we're uh, ready to look at that. Let's do it. Let's do I'm it. all for it if you're up. So for anybody who may be new to Bloodhound or anybody who's busy, been using it for a long time and just hasn't used Bloodhound CE yet, one of the biggest pain points with using any software is just the initial installation and getting started. I know Python-based tools can be a real pain. Even PowerShell-based tools can be a real pain, even though PowerShell is the best scripting language ever invented by anybody. And I will die on that hill. But anybody who used Bloodhound in the past knows how big of a pain it was. So you got to you gotta download Java. You got to download and install the correct version of Neo4j. You got to make sure your environment variables are set up correctly. And you got to do this, 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 and this. You know, at the time when Rohan, Will, and I put Bloodhound out there, that was the best that we could do. So, you know, we had to choose, are we going to make the software as good as we can, or are we going to try to reduce friction on the installation? Now that we have this enterprise level of engineering talent in our team, we don't have to make those kind of choices anymore. We can have things that are great in every part of the user journey. So getting started, it is so easy. Even Justin can do it. That was literally one of the tests. <laughs> like before we launched, <laughs> this it is was the like, criteria. yeah, can Justin yeah. launch it? And, yeah. and I, I did it. It was it took me like seven minutes. Yeah. So uh, this is our documentation, support.bloodhoundenterprise.io. This is this documentation for BHE and BHCE. So installing Bloodhound Community Edition, you need to have Docker. Okay. So that's free. That's that's not a big deal. Once you have Docker, if you're running in Bash, you can literally copy this command, paste, hit enter. So this will download the images. It will configure the containers, start them up, get them talking to each other, create the Neo4j database with the correct version, all that stuff. It'll do, it'll do everything for you. Uh, spin up the API server. There's also a Postgres database in here. So it'll do all that. And at some point, it's going to tell us what our credential is. For, for reference, this previously was like three hours and like mainly reserved for like uh, penetration testers that were like patient enough to like go through the process, right? Anybody on the on the defender side, unless they similarly like stuck through it, they were kind of out of luck. I have a uh, an old video. I know when I was trying to showcase Bloodhound and it was that exact same structure of like, all right, let's get Java. Let's get Neo4j. Yeah. Like, hey, let's double check, kind of guess and check the Neo4j version. So the fact that this can yeah. just fire up in one command is beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So it was actually done here. Um, however, uh, when I was doing this earlier today, when it creates the database for the first time, it will tell you what your credential to log in with is right here. So you can see earlier today, ran the same command. And eventually it says your initial password is this. This is randomly generated. There is no default credential. So the next step is take this credential and log into the web interface, which will be at localhost on 8080. And I did this before, so I'm going to try with the password that I set uh, before. Okay, yeah. So, you know, in the cooking program when they're like, here's the turkey that's been in the oven the entire time. <laughs> yeah, this is this is that turkey. But if I didn't have that credential already set, you just get like a password change prompt and you just change the password to something better. That's it. It's now running. Is it, it, is, it is ready to receive data. It is ready for you to do searches. Uh, if you already have data there, it's ready to be explored. Bloodhound CE has a whole lot of other like enterprise E features that we decided to just include in Bloodhound CE as well. Um, so just like a little quick couple of examples. So you have user management. So I can create a user for you, John. And you know, with network access, I could give you access to my instance here. There's also SAML authentication. So you can let a different identity provider handle identity and uh, authentication. File ingest works very similarly to like legacy Bloodhound. And then data quality, which isn't going to show anything here because this database is, is totally empty right now. You can also download the correct version of the data collector just right here. So if you want Sharpound, boom, there it is. If you want Azure Hound, boom, there it is. You don't have to worry about, oh, I used the wrong version. Like this is the right version for you know the, it's your instance that you're running right there. It's all API driven. And so the GUI is essentially a very, very, very fancy API client. But if you want to write your own API client in PowerShell, the best language of all time, or if you're insane in Python, then the documentation is all here in these uh, 
automatically generated Swagger docs for nice. the API. That is basically it as far as like getting up and running. It was literally one command Heck yeah. and change your credential and that's it. So like it's night and day for getting started. I love the fact, hey, super easy to kick the tires. And I know you were kind of teasing, hey, look at all this quality of life, like user management you can do, SAML. Were those, and, and if I may ask, was that just, look, we want to have this multiplayer support for a handful of different operators for like a real red team engagement and campaign that I have to think had to have been some inspiration pulled from enterprise. Is that right? Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's two things. I think one is like you said, is you're on an assessment. There's going to be more than one operator most of the right. time. And we already had this user management built into Bloodhound Enterprise. So it's like, why not just carry that over into Bloodhound CE and make that available to everybody for free? Like, what does that cost us? Nothing. Security is not something you should charge for. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you can also do MFA uh, here as well in Bloodhound CE and then like SAML configuration. You know, it's like, for me, what it comes down to is, yes, we have the free version and yes, we have the paid version. But if the features of the, of the paid version are are things like MFA or SAML authentication, and that's the differentiator, like mm, that's not enough. Agreed. Like the bar has to be a whole lot higher for, for paid software. Like Justin said, you shouldn't have to pay for security or even just like baseline, like multiplayer software features like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. I didn't text, mean to stomp yeah. on you though. I'll let you keep cruising. <laughs> no worries. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So here's my other turkey that has been in the oven even longer. And this is actually a Bloodhound Enterprise instance. So this is running up in uh, AWS. But the performance and the features that you'll see with what I'm going to show here are exactly what you could expect with a modern laptop where everything's just running locally. So as a pen tester, as a red teamer, what is my favorite thing to look for? Domain admins. So I'm going to search for domain admins and I'm going to look in the Titan Corp domain. Got them. Boom. On the right hand side over here, this is our entity panel. So this tells you information about this node that I just clicked on, which represents obviously the domain admins in this uh, Active Directory domain. Got different information about it. Here's the SID. Does it you know, have ACL inheritance denied? Does it have the admin count set for true or false? What I can also see are some things that would be familiar to uh, most users or maybe new if you're if you're new to Bloodhound. Domain admins, I'm a pen tester. I want to target those users. I want to know what computers they're logged on to. So I can click on sessions right here and I can see for any user that is a member of the domain admins group, whether directly or through nested security group membership, what computers are they logged on to? So if I'm looking at this and I see this computer right here called app six, it's got all these different domain admins logged onto it. Like you better believe that computer is going to be at the top of mind for my entire time looking at that environment. Like that computer is like target number one. Um, and and this computer too, maybe even maybe this computer even more so. This like app five computer. Other interesting things that you can see within this entity panel. So we clicked on this computer. We can see who are the admins on that computer. I prefer the sequential or the stat layout personally. Also, kind of brushing over, but the performance difference from this version of the GUI to the old version is kind of crazy. Um, like drawing out this number of nodes that quickly is is kind of insane. That was smooth um, as butter. <laughs> it's super super smooth. Yeah. Yeah. So the local admins on that computer. So we've got the domain admins group and all, all those people. But then you have these other like one-off users and then any other group that's going to be listed here. The members of those groups are also going to rep be represented. So office admins and then, you know, there's group nesting there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I can see for that computer who the local admins are. I can see it visually. But then what I can also look at is I can see the list representation here as well. Anything in this list right here, I can click on. Just like you can click on a node in the graph, you can click on a node right here to see you know, a, a zoomed in view of, of that particular thing. All right. You know, it's Monday morning. It's 925 AM. I don't have domain admin yet. The imposter syndrome is setting in. So I want to find out how am I going to get from domain user to domain admin? Switch this to the pathfinding feature. And we're going to start off from domain users at Titan Corp. Our target is domain admins at Titan Corp. And there is our attack path. And actually, I want to rewind real quick and I want to re-enable this and then rerun that query. So domain users, which will include basically everybody most of the time, has RDP rights on this computer right here called app four. 
So with RDP rights, I can RDP to the computer as almost anybody in this domain. And then as the pen tester, your job then is to either escalate rights or already be escalated. In our experience, escalating rights in most Windows systems, it's just a matter of time of finding an unquoted service path or a DLL hijack opportunity or something. You know, like there will be something there that will that will let you escalate to the system user. Once you do that, the computer has three different users who were logged on to it interactively. So dump their credentials. And then they are each members of the domain admins group. So then you get a domain admin clear text password. However, let's say that I don't want to RDP for some reason. Well, we can change the rules of how this pathfinding works. Just like Google Maps, you can say like avoid toll roads, avoid highways, you know, whatever. So we can say avoid RDP. So I'll bring up the filter modal. And this is organized into platforms and then tactic, I guess you could say. RDP is a lateral movement tactic. So we'll uncheck can RDP. And then when I hit apply, it's going to rerun the search, but it's going to say don't include RDP and see if there's a path then. So when we do that, then we see that yes, there is. So now instead of RDP being our first step, the domain users group actually has generic all over a user, which there's many, many ways to skin that cat. That user has admin rights on app five, the computer from earlier that was like target number one, where all those domain admins are logged on. This path is relatively simple, but even this relatively simple path would have taken days to find by hand because Active Directory, Windows, it doesn't know for any given identity or any given principle what privileges that thing has. Like that question doesn't even make sense to ask with built-in tooling in Windows and Active Directory. What if you don't know how to execute the, a path using generic at all? <laughs> I am so glad you asked, uh, <laughs> Justin. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be my next question. Yeah. So yeah, like there can be things here that might seem kind of esoteric or they might seem more complicated than they actually are. So any of these edges, so the things that connect the dots, these are called edges or relationships. You can click on them and it will bring up instead of the entity panel, now we have the relationship panel. So it tells us the source, the target, whether it's uh, an ace type edge, it was if it was inherited and the last time this was collected. And then also we have just general information about what this means, just a plain English statement. So the members of this group have generic all on that user. Okay. This is also known as full control. The privilege allows the trustee to manipulate the target object however they wish. Okay. Well, what if I want more detail? What if I don't really know what that means? So we have two different options. You can see Windows abuse. So maybe you are running a beacon, you know, with Cobalt Strike on a Windows host. Here are the actual commands that you could run in order to execute this part of the attack path. Okay, well, what if I'm not on Windows? What if I'm in Linux? Got you covered there too. So Linux tooling is covered here as well. Okay, so that's nice. And this goes into, it goes into like command by command exactly what to what to run or what an attacker can run. And then also for each of those, we'll have offset considerations, including maybe even an event ID that will be generated if it's enabled. And then also references for further reading and generic all, like there's so many references. But um, yeah, just like, you know, what, what I think about is, you know, I forget how to execute these attack paths. You know, like there's a lot of them. There's a lot of different kinds and there's a lot of different scenarios that you can find yourself in. So these references can be very, very helpful for refreshing your memory or for going deeper into, you know, how exactly would a real adversary abuse this? So I have a couple other things to show if we have time. Absolutely. I would love cool. to say, though, look, I know there's a whole lot to love with Bloodhound, but man, that is by far my favorite feature. Because, you know, I think oh, a, nice. a good amount of the audience like may very well just be students or folks really uh, super duper interested in security and want to get into this ethical hacking, pen testing work. But when they're taking like a lot of those security based exams, like hands on application based stuff, and they're working in an Active Directory environment, Bloodhound is, again, the necessity. It is such a vital, critical part of that work. Sure. And then, look, it's not just the map. I love when you can right-click the edge and take a look at those abuse uh, options because like, that's your compass. Here's how to do it. And look, it's the whole guide for everything that you need there. So I love it. I'm sorry. I'm fanboying again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I think one of the things that we've tried to get really good at is reducing friction. So if someone is a student, if someone's like junior chipmunk pen tester, we know the friction. We know what stands in the way of that person being successful because we've been there. And the same is true on the defender side, which... Justin will touch on with the enterprise. So a, a really big part of what we try to do is reduce that friction for our users as much as possible by understanding what exactly is it that they're trying to get done in the first place. And if we can reduce that friction for them, then 
that means that they can be a better security professional for their organization. And then they can improve their organization's security posture, which is just that's the outcome that we want to create, right? So let me show a couple other things. I have a couple other turkeys to pull out of the oven. So let's take a look at this user called R Voigt. And just like kind of an interesting thing to look at. We talk about security group memberships in Active Directory. And anybody who's tried to unravel those by hand knows how huge of a pain that is. So I found this user in our data set that has a pretty interesting security group membership map to look at. So this user, they belong to all these groups right here. But then because this group has been added to these other groups, and because this group added to that group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you wind up with these chains of security group memberships that, you know, for an attacker, this is interesting, but also just for an active directory administrator, if you're wanting to do some hygiene on maybe overlapping or redundant security group memberships, this can be a good way to like start to discover some of those. And things spiral out of control so quickly because of security group nestings. And for me, I'm a visual person. Looking at this visually is the only way that I can really get my arms around this and understand this. And I think a lot of other people work that same way. Way. Um, some people are happy to be in a terminal all day, every day, and just have nothing graphical. I'm not that person, and that's okay. So I think that's pretty interesting. Also, for where a particular user has local admin rights, there's this user, which if we come down to local admin privileges, we can see kind of a another example where this user is added to a group, that group is added to a group, that group is added to a group, the domain admins, uh, which this is a small environment, and the domain admins has local admin everywhere there. A typical audit where you're trying to see who's a local admin on any of these systems, you're going to do like net local group administrators and call it a day. But that's not even close to the real story. And this is a good example showing why that is. Okay, a couple other things I want to share real quick. So we have the Cypher input box back in Bloodhound CE now, which includes syntax highlighting. It includes some autocomplete suggestions and all that kind of stuff. And then in this little folder right here, we've got the pre-built searches. So for example, I can find all the domain admins and that will cover all of the environments that I have any data for. So I can see this is a very large domain admins group. This is a pretty small one. These are distinct from one another. Related to that, I can also map the Active Directory domain trusts or forest trusts. And I can identify clusters where these domains trust one another, but not any of the other ones. These four domains are in a forest and trust one another. And so as a red teamer, if you're looking for doing a SID history attack, or like SID hopping, golden ticket, etc., like this is the kind of data that you need to do that intelligently and quickly. One last thing I want to show. So we're looking at just uh, Active Directory, right? Right now, which has been our bread and butter for a long time. We also have support for Azure. And so I've got a cool attack path to show in our Azure environment. And it's going to start off from an application or an app registration object, this one right here. And it's going to end, let's say, at my user. So my A Robbins user in that tenant. Okay. So let me just walk through this real quick. And then I'm going to hand it over to Justin to start talking about Bloodhound Enterprise. So here is our Azure app registration object. And we'll say that this has been compromised, or maybe even it's like a foreign app that somebody has consented to certain rights for that app in the tenant. So that app, if it wants to authenticate into the tenant, it will do that using a service principle. So the app runs as the service principle, meaning I can authenticate as the service principle if I control the app. This service principle has the VM admin login role assignment on a virtual machine within Azure RM. Well, what does that mean? That means this. It means that you can RDP to it. You'll be a local admin on that system. This VM has several different managed identity assignments, including these two right here. So these map back up to intra ID. Can't say Azure AD anymore. Intra ID service principles. These service principles, there are many, many, many different options from here where you could go. This path right here, this service principle owns this other service principle. So it can add a credential to the service principle. This service principle has lots of different options. 
including the abusable Microsoft Graph app role of appRollAssignment.ReadWrite.all, which means that it can give itself RollAssignment.ReadWrite.Directory, which means that it can promote itself to global admin. And then once you're global admin, you have control of everything, which means you have control of all the descendant objects under that tenant, which then lands you finally at the destination, which was my user there. So little demonstration of our Azure support there. I'm, I'm probably ready to pass it over to Justin to talk about BHE if he's ready for that. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, this is just too cool, though. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's wild to me. Like, look, there can be like one idiosyncrasy uh, or just any of like you mentioned the overlapping groups or how one thing could accidentally and unknowingly fall into something else. And there's yeah. like that domino hmm. effect. And just seeing it visually is absolutely incredible. So yeah, it's powerful. So, so what Andy was showing you is the Explore tab, which the Explore tab is in the Bloodhound Community Edition. And that's why he was, he was demonstrating it because we had you know data in a tenant that he wanted to play it through. But that everything you saw him do, you can do in Bloodhound Community Edition. In Bloodhound Enterprise, there's two other tabs, the Attack Paths view and the Posture view. And before I get back to that, I'm going to go back to Andy's analogy of Google Maps. So let's say your Active Directory, uh, let's let's think of it about, about the map of the United States, right? Um, and as a pen tester, I'm trying to get to my destination. And this analogy, imagine that's the island of Manhattan in New York. Well, let's say I land in LA and I'm going to find a route, right, to, to Manhattan. And I can take any route I want. I can go through, you know, multiple cities to get to that destination. And eventually I get to domain admin, right, Manhattan. As a defender, it's a completely different problem. I got to reverse it. I got to defend the island of Manhattan. So previously, when, you know, before we had Bloodhound Enterprise, it was like, well, what road do you shut down here? It's just kind of silly. It's like, well, is removing this road between Kansas and St. Louis going to do anything to prevent me from going to LA to New York? Like, no, right? So we had this idea, well, Manhattan is an island. Why don't we identify all the bridges into Manhattan and blow them up, right? Like Dark Knight, right? <laughs> like Dark so, Knight. Exactly. I'm, I'm going to get put on a list for saying that. Uh -huh. <laughs> you added but, the Dark Knight caveat, so we're good. <laughs> uh, yeah, Dark Knight was a very important caveat. So that's that's the concept behind Bloodhound Enterprise. Um, we're doing this from the uh, crit like crown jewel assets. If your uh, watchers or like viewers are familiar with like privileged access, like in the enterprise access model, if they've ever heard of tiering, like tier zero, we do all of our analysis from those crown jewels or the things that we want to remove the ability for an adversary to get to above all else, right? Like domain admins, domain controllers, any group policy object that applies to those things, all the members of those groups. So when we deploy Blended Enterprise, we automatically pull every one of these assets out of the domain and I can add additional ones. So if I have an Azure Sync server, I'm going to add that into because it has rights that it needs yeah. to hold. Like EDR orchestration server that can do a, sh a yeah. system shell everywhere, SCCM server, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we have this like core set of assets and these these, these assets you see in Bloodhound Enterprise on this view are collections of multiple assets. Um, I can expand all the attack paths through the domain. Now, this domain is super tiny. I mean, like 50, you know, users or whatever. But in a, like this is running in clients that we have that's like million plus users and they see all of this on one page. Now, all of, you know, there's attack paths that will traverse their environment uh, super deep. But what you should see here is we can take action here and remove all of these attack paths, right? It's like that choke point. That's our bridge to Manhattan. So if we can cut it off here, we don't have to worry about that, that underlying risk. Yeah. So for our enterprise customers, we're going to explain the attack path very similar to how we do uh, on the edge context view. We're going to pull out the affected users. There could be multiple for individual attack paths like this or like the choke points. And importantly, we're going to quantify the risk. So like there's this exposure calculation, which uh, calculates the users that are actually connected to that choke point. So like think of my analogy, how many people can get to the Brooklyn Bridge or the new, the Lincoln Tunnel, right? In New Jersey. So I want to take action on certain choke points faster than others. Like, you know, big clients, they, they have tons of stuff going on every day. You know, if I have 10 total choke points that I'm looking at, um, what's the one that I can shut down today or the, the top three? that might be able to have the greatest reduction in risk. Yeah. I think there's like for the past 20 years with Active Directory, I think security auditors, red teamers have always been kind of stuck with two different sides of the same kind of extreme, which is on one side, you say, well, you should enforce SMB signing because that will increase your security. I'm like, okay, yes. However, most people who have been in operations know how difficult it actually is to sell that to the people who keep the lights on in Active Directory. 
directory. And then also it's like, does it? Does it really increase the security posture? Like it's really hard to measure that. And things that are hard to measure are hard to like sell internally to the people who actually have to go do those things. And then on the other extreme is like, well, you're just going to have to burn it all down and rebuild, or you're going to have to migrate from Active Directory to some other identity platform. Yeah, that's like, that's never going to happen. Almost no organization is going to buy into that. And then you're, you're also kind of stuck with the same problem is like, did that really have an effect on our security posture? Or are we just out of the frying pan and into a different frying pan, you know, with, with a different brand name? And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to, we're trying to solve the problem of attack paths. And by presenting the information this way, the findings are prescriptive. So they're precise. You know, it's not turn on SMB signing everywhere. It's get rid of this one particular privilege. And then it's also empirically measured. So it's the so what? Like, well, okay, well, what if I don't do that? If you don't do that, that means that if anybody lands anywhere in the network, they're going to be able to escalate to tier zero through this one particular connection. And then they're going to be able to do anything they want, deploy ransomware everywhere, like have access to all the data all that kind of stuff. So that combination of it being prescriptive and precise and empirical means that our customers, they're actually making progress on this attack path problem. Yeah, then and like here, I you know I I have this administrator account who logged into this machine that kind of spawned this you know terrible attack path. I can explore that just like you know pivot right to that view that Andy was showing earlier. I can see oh he, he has a session on this box, uh, and we can see you know who else is a local admin there. So kind of again same context. Like I want to dive deeper. I can get detailed information on every node in Active Directory or in Azure. Yeah, now that's great, right? Like we want to cut this this attack path, but um, how? Right, like it says, restrict tier zero. Well, for every finding that we surface in Bloodhound Enterprise, we go super deep in how to fix it. One, because like we find a lot of security people and and I, you know, Active Directory admins don't know um, specific configurations or how to put them in place, and we want to like remove that research element. I'll show you another one here, like where we we go, like we tried to put pictures in. This is super important with Azure. I'll show you an example from our like a test Azure tenant. Azure is something you feel like you kind of got to relearn every month because that you know mm -hmm. something changes out from under you. It's a you know it's a living and breathing directory. So we yeah. try to go super detailed in all the like click here, click here, click here. So yeah, it you shouldn't have to relearn anything um, whenever you come in here, and and you should understand exactly where to go to fix the problem. And also, we're like we're we're adding new research in all the time, right? Into both community edition and enterprise. And so we're going to try to give you as much detail as possible to take action. And then kind of the final thing that I want to touch on is key thing about like defenders is you got to report on like the so what, right? Like you're taking action in uh, your environment. And so like how did you make my organization safer today? We track that over time. Like you can go back three six six, nine months, you name it to see how you've improved. Now, this is a little demo environment that we never fix anything in. So it just gets worse and worse <laughs> and worse. But in a real customer environment, this drops. And I, I would say like, you know, most people start out at like 100% exposed and we take uh, that down by 30 or more percent within the first two to four weeks. I mean, there's always some yeah. like Wi-Fi account that they've had for 20 years that has like some ridiculous permission and we get to rip that out. <laughs> and you you do that across your, you know, your, your entire directory. So this is showing like Andy was showing you kind of earlier on how you can map domain trusts in enterprise. You can see your entire risk footprint over all your active directory domains or Azure tenants. And, you know, like we again, we have like global organizations that have like 100 plus environments in here. And so you can just fix the right problem, right? Like focus your team on what matters. Yeah. So that's the kind of extent of my my side of this. Yeah. I love that. I, I know it's so key. And especially I absolutely want to emphasize and iterate like it's everything. It's your entire environment. Uh, and being able to like, I, as you mentioned, look, be precise, drill down into what to do, what problems there are, and then especially how to fix it. Even those remediation steps are like, again, the most key part in my mind, because like so many orgs, so many, hey, I don't know, you could get some alert or some notice or some security tooling that tells you this bad point to yep. red <laughs> alert. This is a bad thing. Go <laughs> fix it. But they're like, how? I need to know how. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. 
game changer here, guys. Seriously, it, uh, phenomenal stuff. We're super proud of it. Like to be honest with you, when we when we first started getting our customers for BHE, I thought those charts that Justin was showing you, I thought it was going to be like months and months and months and months of like 100%, 100%. Like it was going to take forever for that to go down. That's not what happened. Like our customers, they started making progress on getting that number down way faster than I thought was possible, which was a nice surprise. And then it was also kind of like, oh no, what are we going to do now? Like, <laughs> all, like all of this risk is going away. But it's like, you think about like Voln management, like if, if, you're, if your Voln scanner is telling you like, hey, you're you're at a pretty good level. You're at like, you know, you're, you're missing some critical patches, but it's not that bad. That's that's the position that you want to be in. And it's the position you want to stay in and know that you're in. So this yeah. risk level going down, it doesn't mean that a product isn't like providing any value anymore. It's like, you know what your security posture is related to attack paths permanently. Well, so usually, and we're and like Justin said, we're also people, adding other attack paths as well. And like yeah, yeah. usually so usually people, it's not like staying down forever. Like somebody goes no. and make a configuration change, something happens and it, it could yes. spike all the way back up. Yeah. And then you, someone can do yeah, something you, about that. Usually it goes down like we we get down uh, you know people to a low state. Our goal is to get everybody down below twenty percent. And we, we we I remember like the first time we got somebody to zero, it was like yeah you know. Wow. But like once you go down, you spike like this because people are constantly making changes in in a direct directory, creating yeah. some new application, granting some new privilege. And so they always see it, right? But they shut it down right away, which is yeah. like way easier than seeing it like on a pen test a year or two later where you have all this politics and business process built on top and it gets really hard to like change things. So we're like that monitoring layer that like continues that. that little yeah. Exposure yeah. Yeah. And usually, honestly, like these systems are so insanely complicated. Like a, a Fortune 500 Active Directory is just more complex than one person could ever hope to really fully understand. So somebody makes a configuration change and that increases the risk. That's not that person's fault. It's it's nobody's yeah, right. fault that that happens. Like these are extremely complicated networks and systems. So it's kind of like, I don't know, forgive the pun, but it's kind of a watchdog, like in that sense, right? Like, hey, this thing happened. Here's the outcome of that. Maybe let's revert that change, you watch, know, back to watch dog. I see what you did there. Yeah. yeah thank you. Perhaps a, a <laughs> bloodhound. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of dog based puns uh, on our team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, look, guys, believe it or not, <laughs> I feel like, I don't know, in my mind, and I'd love if, you, hey, help me clarify if need be, but there are two super cool angles here that, like, hey, the hackers, the pen testers, the red teamers, the students that want to, like, get their hands on this and play with it. The best way to learn, not only like local on premise Active Directory, but even Azure, is just play with it. Fire oh, up those yeah. Sharpound collectors, fire up those Azure ingesting tools. Look, the community edition is immediately accessible, super easy to get it run at just a single command and just play. And yeah. look for those uh, other folks over on maybe the other side of the coin, look defenders, look security administrators, the folks that are locking down our environments. You know what? You can get great visibility with community edition. You can see your posture, but you can get even more visibility and great insight uh, with a little bit of that sweet stuff from enterprise. So yeah, yeah. I mean, like Definitely. if you're, if, if you're looking to like do it across like a big domain, if you're like trying to manage identity, like attack paths across like a big environment, you can you can make changes using the community edition. But if you want to like sustained stuff with like an enterprise 24 seven SLA Over and time, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, like continuous collection. That's like another thing in the enterprise side um, that, you know, like for defenders, we're that's why we built it. So yeah, excellent. Well, hey, I could sing your praises for like days. Uh, <laughs> but I would love to include some links in the description to let folks know, hey, me, how they might be able to get their hands on Bloodhound and chat more with you all at Specter Ops. Uh, but look, am I forgetting anything? Is there anything else that you think is really cool? Hey, here's a resource. Here's a reference for you. Or I think we're sitting pretty, guys. This is phenomenal. Yeah. We're, we're always tuned. working on cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like, stay, stay tuned for the end of the year. Yeah. Bloodhound yeah. Slack. Is that, a, is that a thing that's oh, always yeah. popping off? Okay. Bloodhound Slack. Yep. So that's a good place to get support, not only for our stuff, but... Um, um, there are other, like, I think probably the best Golang security channel yeah. might be in the Bloodhound King Slack. <laughs> We're working on new features all the time. We're working on uh, incorporating the ADCS research now. We're going to try to have that out as soon as possible. I don't know if I want to say more than that. Yeah, I heard that uh, little teaser then, from Justin, like, hey, stay tuned for yeah. the end of the year. So we, we might have to hang yeah. out again, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're constantly working on, on new stuff and trying to make 
we're trying we're trying to solve the problem of attack paths like it's honestly we've been talking about ps exec for too long <laughs> on the red team side it's kind of boring these days like if we're <laughs> if we're talking about ps exec 20 years from now i mark that as a personal failure and so we want the whole lateral movement privilege escalation story to fundamentally change that's what we want and we're trying to be part of that and we're trying to do what we can to make that happen Absolutely. You are on the front lines and you guys are crushing it. So, hey, hats off from me. And uh, this has been an awesome conversation. I love the show and tell fireworks. Thank you so much, Andy and Justin. Keep in touch. And I hope, hey, we'll get some other new eyes coming in from our chat today. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, John.